One of the features of the drought that we're now experiencing is that agriculture, and I'm trying to speak as close as possible to your topic about um, driving the innovation, the exact words are sustainable development through agriculture. And basically what I understand you to be saying G2K to your farmers, to your audience, is that we need to get to a stage where we get agriculture to be self-sustaining and the only way you don't get it self-sustaining is if more people or the people who are in it want to stay in it do the things that are required to ensure that it continues and it thrives and that they can maintain themselves they can having gone out in the field in the morning and come home in the evening can pay their bills, send their children to school, and feel comfortable. And the agricultural activity that they practice is in no way going to threaten the agriculture that we need to practice into the future for food security. That's a sort of simplistic definition of what I interpret sustainable agriculture to mean. The truth is that if you take that definition, and look at how we have practiced agriculture in the Jamaica today. Um, I, I would prefer to de describe our agricultural practices as a sort of boom and bust agriculture. A, a period for feast and a period for famine. And the Jamaican farmers have felt it. For those of you who have been in agriculture for many, many years, and I see a couple of older heads in the room, you know what I mean when I talk about feast and famine and boom and bust. There's a time when you have it in abundance and there's a time when you don't have nothing at all. There's a time when you probably can afford the fertilizer and there's a time when you have to go without it. There's a time when you can buy a new shoes for your son or your daughter or for yourself. And there's a time when you have to walk with the shoes. You can't even carry it to the shoemaker. Now, that can't be the way to practice a particular skill. That can't be the way to live your life. That's not supposed to be how it's supposed to go. The truth is that in Jamaica today, we have two sets of farmers. And we must accept it. We must be practical and pragmatic about it so we can deal with it accordingly. You have a set of farmers who practice agriculture for their own survival but it's not creating a whole heap of economic activity. It's almost like a welfare program, agricultural path program. So you have a man who has a little plot of land, he raises a couple of fowl and then lay eggs and him use it. He plant a little head of yam sweet potato, banana, and all of that help him to sustain himself and him trade a little bit so he can afford a little protein. You have another set, and that's a large segment of the population. And in a sense, when governments over the years love to give out the one bag or the half bag of fertilizer, in a sense, that will never make a farmer rich. It will never allow that farmer to be self-sustaining as the topic here is suggesting that we need to get to. It just allows him to live from hand to mouth. That's the reality. A bag of fertilizer can't provide wealth for a farmer. It might serve him well for the next crop or for the next cycle, but after he finishes him not doing the other things right, him back to square one. Feast and famine, boom and bust. That's the feature of the agriculture that we practice in Jamaica over, over generations. There's another set of farmers though that have tried to be a little more large scale. So they plant in abundance and they've tried to move it from the field into production, into manufacturing, into spices and sauces or export it in its current form. And in so doing, they have to hire some people, they have to pay some taxes, so they create some economic activity. We need to understand those two sets of people, Mr. Fulton, rather. And we need to appreciate what is required to address 
those two sets of circumstances. We can't treat all farmers the same because all farmers are not the same. It differs. And there is a different prescription that has to be meted out. At the end of it all though, the truth is that we have to change our mindset and our mentality and our approach towards agriculture as a country. For too long, agriculture in Jamaica has been seen as almost the bastard child of the economy. Right? The eat and left. And it's so ironic or to use another word, so sad because most of the working population of the Jamaican people depend on agriculture to survive. Rural life is agriculture. In, in statistical terms, you have about 19 or 20 percent of the population, working population, you have about 1.2 or so million working population, so you're talking about well over a couple hundred thousand people who depend on agriculture to survive. There's no other profession that have them kind of numbers, you know. Even though it represents only six and a half or so percent of GDP, meaning of the whole economic activity of the country. Which means that is a little bit for share up for a whole heap of people. And that's another part of the boom and bus feature that we have to deal with. So the mentality has to change. Now to change that mentality, we have to change the structure of agriculture. In the past, remember now, before we got independence, we were just told by the colonial masters that we must just grow what themselves must grow and send it come to them to process and to brand. So sugar, banana, cocoa, and I could go on. We were just the planters. We were at the bottom of the food chain. We used to just cultivate for other people to take and to package and make look good and put in, you know, in the case of sugar, you create granulated sugar as we know it as, white sugar, and sell it as a branded product in England or Europe for a premium price. There was a time when sugar was gold you know, in Europe. Is that Bill Europe? He never built Jamaica because we were at the bottom of the food chain. So when I talk about changing the mindset for sustainability, what I'm suggesting as a first point I want to raise, and I'm going to go into two or three particular crops after, we need to understand at the policy level that agriculture cannot be substantially a welfare activity. It must be a business. It must be treated like banking, like insurance, like any other business that is out there. You have some issues that you have to deal with. You have some costs that you have to put in. You have the effort that you have to put in. You have the value that you have to create. And you must get the return at the end of the day. And government's role and responsibility is to ensure that that framework is established. Now, that framework is very simple. It is about creating value. Agriculture for farmers is going to be most efficient if when you finish producing the ginger, it goes into a manufacturing facility where it makes ginger powder or ginger tea or ginger drink or, just to give an example, and it's branded and packaged and it's not only served to you but it is served to other people throughout the world. And we have excellent examples of that, the pica pepper sauce, the, give me one Mr. Mr. Montague, the, the, the coffee that we jerk. call Blue Mountain Coffee, the jerk yes. sauce that we see selling all over the world. Because Jamaica have a great brand name. We're just not producing enough and producing consistently. So any government who is serious about agriculture must understand that the way to liberate the farmer is to get that farmer to grow and grow efficiently and get that farmer's output to be placed in a value-added position. Just to give you a piece of statistic again, we did some work when we were in the ministry that showed that while primary agricultural output, meaning the food that you reap from the field in its raw form, the yam, the banana, the ginger, represents 6.5% of economic activity. When you put it in a manufacturing process, or you package and you brand it and you export it, it represents up to three or four times more economic activity. 
you understand the difference? Because the more value you create, the more economic activity it represents, is the better it is for you because you get more pay out of it. And for too long, we have depended too much on just the primary production. So what does that mean for you as a farmer in this area? What do you do with the banana where you grow? Can you get it to become banana chips? Where it can be packaged? Where it won't spoil? Longer storage uh, shelf life? Can you get it to be exported and notice that the other day you start shipping bananas again into England? I don't know if you are the driver of that, Madam, Madam President, or somebody else. But whoever is doing it, it's good. If we could put a little brand on it and make it Jamaican bananas, then it would even add a little more because we have a nicer tasting ripe banana, by the way, than in the other countries. I have I proved that for myself, right? Just as though we have a better ginger, we have a better hot peppers, so hot peppers and so on. The chemical profile of Jamaican agriculture is much better for a number of reasons which I won't go into. So that's the value-added approach that we know. When one thing both former and current administration agree on is that there was a program that we had started when I was minister, carried on by my colleague here, called the Agroparks, that is being much heralded now under this administration and is in fact even a part of an IMF agreement where it was supposed to be a tool to create greater value in agriculture. And one of the questions I'd like to ask, because I really don't know, I'm really not sure, and I see some of the farmers protesting <coughs> against some of the things happening with this concept called agropark. I'd love to know what percentage of the output coming out of the agropark is just primary production. Because I hear the government quoting some statistics about how much the agroparks contribute to economic activity through food output. But I want to know how much of that is going into some sort of manufacturing facility, how much of it ending up into a branded product, and therefore becomes an exportable product, a product with longer shelf life, and a product that can bring greater value back to the farmers. Because I am here to say to you, at the risk of being controversial, if the agroparks currently, as they are now being implemented, only involve or involve substantially just farmers growing and nothing happening after that when the farmer's output come out, then it's not going to serve the purpose that for which it was intended. That was not how it was conceived. That is not how it is to be pursued. And I want to say that to my, my friend Roger, I hear he's not well, and I wish him all the best, that he needs to pay close or closer attention to what the agroparks were actually intended to do. When we started the model, I come into that. When we started the model, but you see, I should hurry up, so uh, I suppose it all also. When we started the model in Hanslow, St. Elizabeth, and we started in that area because it's the largest block of irrigated land, so over 3,000 acres have irrigation infrastructure, and water is critical to agriculture. We built a pepper mash facility and a packing house. We refurbished the small room dance facility and we built a training center for farmers that RADA and National Irrigation would operate. So we brought farmers in and showed them how to plant, how to do water management, how to reap, how to store. Those facilities are there. What those facilities are now doing, and they're run by the private sector, by the way, they are now contracting with farmers. So you have literally hundreds of farmers who are contracted to grow the hot pepper, just as a case in point, or grow the callaloo, transport it to that location, it would be cleaned and mashed and packaged and go into further processing. We went further. We said the farmers must be paid within a reasonable time. Because in the past, no bandulu business run where farmers, because they're desperate to sell, are taken for granted by the middlemen who take what they have and don't pay them. And what we did, we set up a system where the farmers got into high tech. We gave them a bank card or worked with them to establish it. And the money would be remitted to their account within seven working days 
after they deliver to the packing house. So farmer never have to go and stand up at anybody's door and, and, and see as if they are beggars waiting to be paid after they put out their hard day's work and deliver their goods to the factory. I don't know if it's still going on, Mr. Fulton, but it was part of that value chain approach. So basically what we did, we trained the farmers at the facility, we established contracts with them or helped them to establish contracts. They would grow and deliver to a manufacturing or agro-processing facility and when they deliver, they would get paid within a reasonable time. Now it means that the farmer had to maintain a certain standard, which is why the training was important. It's not a free for all. But it also meant that the other people along the value chain also had obligations and they had to stick to those obligations. So I say the agro-park as a concept is a very important concept to change the mindset and the approach to agriculture in Jamaica. Because it's starting you from the soil preparation right through to the manufacturing. We need to do more of it. It needs to become more the norm than the exception. But it's very important that we get it right. And I hear some of the farmers complaining in a way that suggests that we're not exactly there. I don't want to be overly critical, but I want to say to the administration and the minister, and Mr. Fulton who is here, let's make sure we do the thing right. And if you want some help, I'm sure Mr. Hutchin, MP Hutchinson can help you, since he is very aware of that concept, since he was part of the formulation of it when he was in the ministry with myself at that particular time. I want to just say a couple other quick things and then I'm going to sit down. The Another critical area to modernizing agriculture is information flow. And information flow in the sense that the farmers must know where the markets are and the markets must know what the farmers have. Anytime you have imperfect information, where the farmers grow and don't know where to sell, people take advantage of them. One of the things that we did, you know, we did a survey, and it was an ongoing survey of what the difference was between farm gate price and the price of the produce in the farm section in the supermarkets. And would you believe it, when that survey was done, it shot the heck out of me. Because sometimes there was like a five and six hundred percent difference between what the farmer produced and what the supermarket selling it as. And the consumer would say, boy, them are them farmer, yeah, they're inefficient. Them, them, them unproductive. Why should I have to pay so much for a bunch of banana or a local Irish potato? When really and truly is that the farmer benefiting? Is that man who come take the food from the farmer and tell the farmer, say, listen, we can't get it up the road cheaper, you know. So I'm mean, need to pay you this. You have to give me credit, you know. You know it, you know. And guess what? Nobody can have food me again. I've living for three and a half years. I've been just there with the farmers, right? And then you see the big prices at the store level. And the farmer, poor farmer, lucky if they get 10% from what they produce something. That is cruel. And the government have a responsibility to even out that information flow. And so, we introduced a novel concept. In addition to the rather marketing man who's supposed to survey the prices, we introduced something called the farmer's markets. And for the life of me, and I, you know, I'm here as Capri, but I'm a member of the Labour Party and still love my party. But for the life of me, I want to leave the heavy hitting to JC. I don't understand why it is that this administration has chosen to discontinue the farmer's market that has served the interests of the farmers and consumers so well during the period that we had the farmer's market in place. Because what it did, you know, it brought the farmers directly to the consumers. It gave the consumers a taste of what the farmers were doing and how they were producing. There was nobody in between the farmer and the consumer. And word gets around. If you had a farmer's market in every parish, once a month, it would provide enough information gathering to the consumers to ensure that they know what is going on in the field and it would force the middlemen who oftentimes are the biggest beneficiaries of local farmers production to control their prices because people would now know and be willing to talk about it and some consumers will boycott it 
information is key. And Mr. Fulton, we need to get that information flow back. And I urge you, talk to the minister and get him to introduce back the farmer's market in a more structured way. Because it makes sense and it has a lot of value. There are three things I think we could do to improve efficiency quickly. One, the food import bill is about a billion dollars. Right? That's what we pay to import food. We can pick out a couple of the key items that we currently import. The top ones are obvious. Rice. You know, we used to grow rice one time. No, not that little bit that we did grow. We, we, we. we used to grow a lot more one time, right? And rice production in Jamaica, if we are to be brutally honest, was destroyed by unfair international trading practices. That's the reality. Heavy subsidies in other countries made it un viable for local farmers to produce it because we just couldn't compete because the other governments were the developed countries were giving big subsidies they used to have a program called pl 480 which was rice aid which was aid that came out of north america now we're not criticizing aid support because if we can get it it's good but when it when it gets into formal economic trade it serves the purpose of feeding and addressing poverty, but it undermines the productive capacity because it introduces unfair trade practices. So you literally have to separate markets when you have trade. When you have trade and aid, you, you can't get free food from another country, sell it below the cost of production in the market, and expect the local farmers who grow the same thing to compete because him can't sell below cost of production. Because him needs to make back his money and make a little profit. It's simple, right? It's not rocket science. So if you, if you have lower than cost of production food selling, it serves a particular purpose, but in the long run, if you're not careful, and it mixes up with the real economy, production is going to destroy or damage the real economy. And that's what happened to rice. So we came out of it. Truth is, we have some lands. We did some work when we were in the ministry where we think we could produce based on the lands that we have we don't have all of it as we used to up to 30,000 tons of rice we did the experiment experiments we brought in different varieties we looked at the yields we selected the right two or three varieties that was the one where you saw Roger sampling the rice and the cartoonists have had a field day with him on that because he was at one of the the field, the, work, the field days when we were sampling the different type and looking at the yields and so on. Because we felt that we needed to work together so continuation would take place. And he, and he graciously agreed to be there. And we, we, we appreciated that he did that. We formed a Rice Growers Association. Believe it or not. We, we brought people together who were interested who had the land. We got ADM milling, now known by many of you as Jamaica Flour Mills, to donate 300,000 US dollars to buy rice equipment. The equipment was bought. I went to their head office in um, one of those US states. Brought, Minister said, drove them too. Brought equipment into Jamaica. We identified a facility down in Clarendon that is a coffee facility. Clarendon. Ter Tarantum, down in uh, Clarendon, that because the process of the processing of coffee is relatively similar to what you have to do with the rice, with some minor adjustments. We identified a facility to do that, the processing. We, we were looking at financing, government change, right? And I, I can't hear anything after two and a half years as to what is happening to the rice, the rice project. No. We spend about 70 million US dollars a year on growing rice and buying importing rice. So rice represents 7% or so of the food import bill. There is no reason why we shouldn't try to deal with that by just continuing the program that was started by the previous administration. Uh, it would create jobs, it would foreign exchange earn them. And frankly speaking, we could claim that we have a product that we all of us love because everybody eats rice. 
as an example of how we could make some progress in terms of the agricultural sector in a particular crop area. The other one is a school feeding program. We need to graduate from the heavy import content within the school feeding program. Government have total control over that. And frankly speaking, we need to make Jamaicans feel and know, starting with the younger ones, that eating two fingers of banana and a piece of sweet potato is much better than eating five dumplings. It may be more filling for the dumpling, but it's more healthier to eat the local produce that is here. And I believe that the government as a policy should actively pursue, actively pursue where within the school feeding program we can eliminate the import content. I know there's a cost issue. I know it's about cost and stretching the dollar. But frankly speaking, and that's another discussion, the waste that take place with some of the very activities in the school feeding program, like Nutrition Products Limited, just read out the general's report. Those savings, if we're more efficient, could be channeled back into supporting local farmers who in turn would have some form of economic activity and it feeds on itself because it also changes the attitude and the mindset of our people. So they grow up accepting that sweet potato is better than flour because it is. Complex carbohydrates, that's a scientific explanation, right, Mr. Fulton? Much better for you. And we must make our children understand that. And farmers, you are the biggest spokesperson because you're in the business. But we must help you too, as a government, by giving you the policy that supports the transition there. The tropical fruits that we have are second to none. Instead of giving a child some artificial sweetener, and in America they do it, in England they do it. A child gets a fruit. There's no season in Jamaica where we don't have a fruit in abundance. Even if it's a common mango. And I have no regrets in saying, I would ensure that during common mango season, every primary school child gets a common mango as part of the school feeding program. Because it is nutritious, it is ours, and it contributes to some form of economic activity. And it saves on the demand for foreign exchange rate for food. <laughs> And finally, uh, export agriculture is fundamental. You know, this debate about depreciation or devaluation, as some people call it, is an important debate and one that must be resolved at some point from a policy perspective. The reality is, whatever the IMF says, the reality is a country that is heavily dependent on imports to support its lifestyle as we are as a country. Devaluation leads, or depreciation leads to greater hardships for the people who have to buy those imported products. Whether it is shoes, clothing, car, or food. We're talking food here tonight. I would say we have a billion dollars of food import bill. Every time the food leave Miami port, or New York port, or wherever else it leave. It has to be paid for with foreign money. Every time the dollar change and it takes more Jamaican money to buy the foreign money, the person who bring it here have to make back their money. So they won't charge you more. It's not rocket science. So the opposite is also true. If you can grow more here, the hot pepper, the ginger, and whatever else you grow, where the inputs are primarily, not exclusively, because you have to put in the chemicals and the fertilizer that is imported. But labor is a big part of it, your local labor. The sun and the soil and the water is a big part if you can put those systems in place. The biggest advantage or the one critical sector that has a huge advantage with depreciation or devaluation as we know it has, is the agricultural sector. If we can have greater levels of local input and at the end of it we can export and government is defensive about the devaluation question but their case would be greater or more advanced or perhaps even more accepted if while they were defending it they were showing farmers how to grow more grow more efficiently and export what they grow 
the farmers will be smiling because when they export, they'll be earning US dollars and it will be a stronger case for them to go afford the other things that they need. And the truth is, as a policy, as a country, we need to do more to push the export process. So ladies and gentlemen, there is so much more that we could say, but Mr. Hutchinson is here. I think this is a great topic. It's a timely topic because as things get tighter in our economy, it has always forced us to focus a little more on finding solutions to some of these problems. And agriculture represents a huge potential for us. It's important enough to be focused on because so many people depend on it. And there are a lot of initiatives that are already out there that, are, that exist on paper that can be implemented to enhance the lot of the farmer and the farm families and Jamaica in general, if we do it right. Thank you very much, and I'll take some questions. Out.